I'm here in Medjugorje and I'm with Father, what's your name? Stephen Dardis. Where are you from? From New Orleans, little town of Luling outside New Orleans, Louisiana. And how often have you been in Medjugorje? This is my third time coming. It's Why do you come back? It's a beautiful place to re renew retreats, mm -hmm. spend some time in quiet prayer. Mm -hmm. We bring a, a group of pilgrims each time if we can help it. I've been trying to come for years, but between COVID and we had a huge hurricane hit Louisiana mm -hmm. last couple of years ago, so it's been kind of hard to get back, but uh, it's, it's good to come. And what did you thought or think about Medjugorje when you had the first time about the story of Medjugorje? Oh, it was beautiful. Actually, my parents and family, I didn't come, but when I was younger, my parents came with, with the rest of my family in 1987. Mm -hmm. and it was very powerful. I mean, my family has really benefited from the Blessed Mother. She's been very good to me. To all of us, I really owe my vocation to Our Lady. My mother remembers on a retreat in the 90s. She she asked the Blessed Mother to watch over all of our family, and and really we we are so humbly blessed by the way Our Lady has taken care of us. And we owe that to a lot of things, but especially to the time we spent, my family spent in Medjugorje. And about uh, 10, 10 years ago, I started to try to bring pilgrims to go see Rome. Mm -hmm. And then from Rome, we often come across Italy to Medjugorje. So it's a very beautiful, balanced trip of, of the roots of our faith in Rome, mm -hmm. the martyrs who've gone before us, St. Peter, St. Paul. And then you come for a few days here to Medjugorje to be close to our Blessed Mother. And like she taught us, ponder the graces of God, ponder the experiences in our hearts. You know, she, Our Lady's words were, were, were described in the Bible. She pondered all these things in her heart. It's great, great for us to come here and do that with her. Yeah. You feel that our Lady is here in Medjugorje? I believe so. I just see the fruits. So many, so many come back mm -hmm. with a greater love for the church, for confession. It's one thing for someone to have an experience where they say, I just want to be a nicer person. I just want to be a more profound person in life. But people come back from Medjugorje saying, I want to go to confession more. I want to be a more in involved person in my faith. I want to bring the message of, of God's love and mercy and the, the closeness of our Blessed Mother to more people. So that's what, mostly what I see coming back from men, those who've gone to Medjugorje. It's a greater love for the Church and a greater appreciation for the gifts of the sacraments. So I, that's why I do feel like Our Lady has some hand in things here in Medjugorje. And what is for you the beauty of the Catholic faith as a priest? Why did you choose to become a priest, the second that's priest? A, that's a really good question. I think I, I have to always come back to the fact that I did not choose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he chose me in, yeah. in a way that I was hesitant to embrace. I remember when I was in high school, I said, Lord, if this is what you're asking for me to be a priest, please don't ask. And then little by little, it was my senior year in high school and freshman year in college. By the end of my freshman year, I was very open to the possibility of priesthood. I had some really beautiful experiences with priests in college mm -hmm. at Texas A&M. There's some great priests at Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. And um, I entered a religious life and really blessed to have a beautiful religious formation. Mm -hmm. And then, gosh, 13 years later, I was ordained to the priesthood. And now 10 years later, I've really been grateful to God. And I look back and, and I say, God, thank you for not listening to my prayer when I was in high school and told you not, not to ask me. Thank you, for, thank you for, for allowing me to, the privilege of, of ministering to your people as a priest. It's been How, beautiful. Uh, to be honest, as a man, you feel sometimes alone as a priest? Uh, I think there, I, I would say yes, but not more than any other married couple that I've walked with. When you're married, you have moments when you feel distant from your spouse. Mm -hmm. And I feel like every vocation has has moments that are a healthy loneliness and of course there's unhealthy moments of loneliness but i do think our lord allows moments of loneliness for every person husband wife priest nun to to draw near to him above all things to remind ourselves no person can fill our hearts our hearts are made for god and moments of loneliness remind us that our heart is not made for any one thing or one person in this world to satisfy it our heart is almost like you could say that infinite hole if you try to fill an infinite hole with finite goods, you can't. It's, that's addiction. But rather, moments of loneliness do remind us that there's something more our hearts are made for. So there are moments, but they're meant to be healthy moments of loneliness in our life. Yes. And what would you tell, you know, my brother always asked that I should ask this question. A lot of people think that God the Father is an angry old man with a white beard and he's waiting to judge us and to put us to hell. And then he's very, very happy. And it's not like that. No. Could you describe him? No, for he's, all of us? A, he's a father. He's well described as the father of mercies, the way Jesus describes him with the prodigal son. 
He's a father that we can think of him the way we want to. It doesn't really matter. He's still going to pursue us in a good way, in a loving way. We have many opinions of our fathers or our parents. Some parents did a better job than others. Who knows? But um, the Father of Heaven is a father who's he's a merciful, loving shepherd. He goes after the lost sheep. And he doesn't care what the sheep think of him. He still yes, goes after he's them. Still lost, <laughs> it's no? really very much. There's only very love much. in him. No? All he thinks about is his children. It's beautiful. And how did you make that experience? I think we all have to, as Jesus said, the rebirth in the spirit. We all have to somehow experience him personally in our life. How did that happen in your life? I think we had punctuated moments of the Holy Spirit, punctuated moments of God's mercy. I've certainly had my share of beautiful confessions of God's mercy that was always greater than my sins, even my worst sins. God's mercy was always greater, continues to be always greater. Um, and then we have the punctuated moments of mercy and an ongoing conversion, an ongoing every day for the rest of our lives, trying to delve deeper into that experience of mercy, trying to live more and more according to an experience of mercy, and not saying they're like, oh, well, I, I was converted, so now I can relax. It's an ongoing conversion to God's love, to be more of a, a more perfect reflection to others of the merciful heart of the Father that we first received. Like Jesus says, as you have freely received, so freely give. Yeah. And what would you tell people, you know, confession is very important in Medjugorje, but there are a lot of people out there, they are scared. What did I do? 30 years didn't go to confession. What would the priest think of me? What you as a priest, what would you tell them? How you see it? What is the beauty of confession? Why not fear? I think more people should share their experience of confession, those who've had a good experience to share with others. It's not as scary as I thought it would be. So often I hear people say, I was scared, but it wasn't so bad. I was scared, but it wasn't so bad. It's not so bad. I mean, the hardest part is, yes, I have to say things that might be a little uncomfortable. If I'm ashamed of things that I did in my past, yes, I have to say those things. But you're saying them to a father who, I mean, first of all, he's a sinner himself. There's not going to be a hypocrisy in confession. And, and secondly, he's a father trying to remind you that God's last word to your sins was a word of mercy, not shame. So, and, and many times when we were in second grade, we had to memorize a prayer or something, and we were scared because we forgot how to say that prayer or the act of contrition. I don't have it memorized anymore. It was meant to be an act of contrition, not a formula of words for contrition. So if you forgot how to do confession, don't worry. The best way to start is by saying, Father, forgive me, I don't know what to say. That's a great start to confession. Oh, Let the priest see it. Lady, yes, it's exactly. It's easy. It's easy. What would you tell people? Lately, I met people who are somehow very sad or angry with God. As a priest, what do you give them as an advice? I think sometimes we are angry with God, mainly like a teenager who's angry with the parent who allowed something to happen or, or didn't let the teenager go to something that didn't work out. The teenager wanted and the, the parents said no. The teenager may think the parent doesn't want their good, doesn't love them. But it's a teenager and you don't understand yet. And I think if we were able to wait long enough, we would see that what my father was doing, what my parent was doing was for my good. I just didn't see the whole story. Or he was letting me face life, which is hard, but he was going to carry me the whole way. And sometimes it's important not to judge too quickly. I always tell people, sometimes in our stories of life, we put the period too early in the story. If we wait longer, there's more to the story. Certainly if you tell any story the wrong way, if you tell any story with, with the shorter, only the bad, well, you've missed the rest of the story. There's more to our story sometimes that I think even we can remember. And it is important to heal our memory, to remember the whole story of our lives, the moments of our lives where sure, maybe there were some tough things that happened, some bad things that were allowed to go on in our lives. Okay, but maybe Maybe more, there's more to it. Maybe God worked out some great things because of it. Or especially in the big picture towards heaven, certainly then we will see what God was doing the whole time, what God was preparing the whole time. So true, Father. And um, Father Pio is saying the rosary is the weapon of our times. Okay. For Santa Lucia of Fatima, she's saying um, the rosary, you can solve every problem with the rosary. Did you make the same experience? I do Father? feel like holding on, you have something to hold on to with the rosary, and whether it's an experience of the problem being solved quickly or the problem being solved over time, throughout the experience of whatever you go through, you hold on to the rosary. If you can say the prayers, pray the rosary daily. Our Lady invites us to pray the rosary daily. The devil certainly tries to dissuade us, to keep us from praying the rosary. Amazing how easy it is to feel the pressure not to pray the rosary. But it's because it's so powerful. 
And it has a way of just keeping us close to our Lord, even when we're struggling with, with life or struggling with our faith. Just hold on to the rosary. And Our Lady doesn't let go. So sometimes we let go, Our Lady doesn't let go. Like a good mother doesn't yes, let go. That's right. It can be the worst situation. No? And um, you also made the experience that we pray and we act like thy will be done in my life, that life becomes easier, smoother, more in peace, more joyful. We, the rosary helps us change our hearts. Mm -hmm. Life is hard, like we know that. The world that is around us today, it's, it's a broken world. It's not the world that God created for us. It's the world that God created for us that we kind of have contaminated with sin and the evils of sin and the disasters around us and the headlines in the news. So life is broken. But the rosary and prayer, our Lord and through our Blessed Mother even, changes our own inner dispositions to be more like that of her son. What was Jesus' attitude towards suffering? Yes, it was bad. The Gospels tell us that in Gethsemane, in his agony, Jesus prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to go through this agony. But he also said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And in prayer, it's like our heart is molded and conformed to the heart of Jesus. And we're given the strength that he had, the heavenly strength, to go through very painful, sometimes very painful earthly experiences, but with a heavenly strength. So we do. We, we want prayer, real prayer of the heart to change our hearts as we go through the good times with greater exaltation towards God, greater gratitude for the good times, and also in the moments of our own agonies, to say, Lord, I trust in you through this agony. I unite my agony to the Father's will. And we just say, Jesus, I trust in you. Hold on to me through this moment. Let prayer conform my heart to yours. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, what, what is that for you? What is the difference with the rosary and the praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet? I think the, the Lord has given us such a diversity of prayer to meet every single person with every single need. People pray both those prayers in different ways. I find a lot of times people are, are close to the Divine Mercy Chaplet in the moment of death, mm -hmm. the dying of a loved one. That's something that they pray, especially in those moments. We're invited every day at the three o'clock hour of Jesus' Passion to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, to be united to Him. But I do feel like, like there's so many ways of praying because there's so many different people who can resonate more with one prayer than with another. But our Lord offers us all these resources, all these different kinds of prayer for different occasions and for different people to relate better to some than to others. But it's a, it's a, it's a wealth of, of you, if you want to use that image of, of, of weaponry, just choose your weapon. The, the chaplet today, the rosary tomorrow, or in the three o'clock hour of the chaplet, the six o'clock hour of the rosary. But just to constantly have that, that resource to recourse to prayer. Beautiful what to say, Father, and it's. I think it's also for us men. We can. We want to be knights. We want to. That's right. Warriors. The warriors, and we can. We have the rosary. We have the banner. It's Our Lady, and you, you start prayer groups. No, That's men right. That's prayer right. groups. As well. Men's groups, women's groups, mom's groups. It's yes. really good. And and what would you say? Tell people. You know, Jesus said he's guided by the Holy Spirit. How can we be guided by the Holy Spirit? How can we have that personal relationship? How would you explain that to people? I think. Honestly, I think, first of all, it's believing that the Holy Spirit wants to have a relationship. It's, it's beginning with that faith conviction. I know, Lord, that you want to reach me. I know, Lord, that you want to speak with me. Holy Spirit, I know you want to come into my heart. So, A, I invite you in. Come, Holy Spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit into my life, into my decision-making. And then secondly, be quiet. <laughs> Silence. The Holy Spirit wants to speak, but it's like so many stories in the Gospels and in, in the Bible, he speaks not in the loud noise and the anxiety and the storms. He speaks in the silence when we allow our hearts to be still. When we, we hang out the cell phone, we get off of Facebook and, and TikTok for a little while to listen, to be still and look like the washing machine after it goes. It takes a long time for the washing machine to stop. And silence takes a long time. Of, you're not just like, okay, I'm silent for five seconds. So now I'm ready to listen to the Holy Spirit. No, I might need to be silent for like a whole 30 minutes. Just like trying to work on that habit of concentration. And it's a muscle. You build a muscle of, of concentration. You build a muscle to silence my mind, my thinking, my heart, my desires. Silencing calm. Bringing my whole being to a calm in which I can recognize the movements of the Spirit. And I can discern, okay, this movement is from my, my pride wanting something, my desire wanting something. This movement is from the Holy Spirit moving me towards something else. So it's, it's, it takes time. But invite the Holy Spirit in, quiet the heart, and then learn over time to discern His voice over others. And what would you tell? I was lately in, in an environment, not Catholic, 
uh, not maybe cultural Catholic. Sure. And they said, oh, Tom, you're, you're hearing voices. Maybe you should go psycholog. <laughs> right. What, what right. do you tell these people? I think in general, I think we do presume that why would God speak to me or why would God speak to the person next to me? Surely God doesn't speak to us. Mm -hmm. And I think the contrary is true. He's always trying to reach out to us. He does speak to each person a little differently. Mm -hmm. So my experience of God speaking to me may not look like Tom's experience of God speaking to him. Mm -hmm. But God's always reaching out. God's always going to find a way into to your heart. Honestly, I'll be very, very vulnerable. Sometimes I think God speaks to me through movies. Because some yes. of the images in movies speak to me very clearly. I'm like, oh, that makes me understand better something about the way Jesus relates to his people. So it's just God finds a way to reach you and to me. Sometimes it's a movement of the heart. Sometimes it's a little whisper getting our attention very almost audible for some people. They share. Like they heard a voice and they move them. Um, so I don't, wanna, I don't think we need, want to be dismissive when someone experiences God. I do think St. Paul gives us very good advice. Mm -hmm. Receive everything, test the spirits, discern the spirits. Find someone, if you feel like God's speaking to you in some way, bring that to a priest or bring that to someone who can help guide you in discerning. Is this really God's voice for me? Is this some other voice? Is this a voice I don't want to follow? So it's important, I guess, God speaks to us. But he also gives us a church. He gives us priests, clergy, religious sisters and nuns who can help us get to know ourselves and get to recognize correctly the voices and the way God speaks to us. Mm -hmm. And you said you often pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet with people before dying. You know, I think we can all can learn some lessons from these people before dying and not make the mistakes. What do they regret before dying and what, what should we learn? Oh, many, many. There's actually some Google lists. You might want to Google people's greatest regrets before death. Mm -hmm. There's a list and it usually has something to do with, I wish I would have slowed down in life. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have spent more energy on my friends and my family than on my career. I wish I would have been less worried about what people think of me. Those are all tremendous lessons from those who are on their last footsteps in this life. Looking back, they tend to share the same wisdom that would really help us a lot to learn that wisdom earlier. Stop worrying about so many things that really don't matter in the long run and start focusing on the things that I want at the end of my life to have cared most about. My faith, my family, my friends, the impact I can make and not letting other people's opinions keep me from the greatness to which God calls me. So beautiful, Father, what you say. And for, for you, what is the most beautiful spot in Medjugorje? Oh, I really appreciated Apparition Hill. Mm -hmm. It's not a hard climb, but at the top, it's so peaceful. And the, we were very blessed with beautiful weather. So you're at the top of the hill with just a view of the village, and it's so quiet, peaceful, the wind blowing. And there is Our Lady statue memorializing her, her visitation to the visionaries. She's still present there, and she gets our attention. And it's a little bit of a hike, you know, you kind of push yourself a little bit, but there at the top, you relax, and you just calm your inner self, your inner noise of the heart, and you just let God speak through His creation, let God speak through His mother. So it's, it's a beautiful spot. The last question, or two last questions. The Eucharist, you know, the real presence. What does that mean for you as a priest? I think the privilege of holding Jesus in my hands the privilege of being able, like the Apostles, to distribute Jesus to others. A lot of times I, I do think of the Blessed Mother in Bethlehem, mm -hmm. how she held baby Jesus out for others to come venerate Him, come kneel before Him. I'm sure she was humble. Why would God choose me to have this role? And in some ways, the priest learns from Our Lady how to always be in awe that God would allow me, with my own struggles, my own imperfections, my own sins, to nevertheless hold Jesus and allow others to receive him through me. God comes to the world through Mary. God comes to the world through the priest. And it's, it's just an invitation as you hold the Blessed Sacrament to never forget what you hold, to never take for granted the chance to celebrate the Mass well, slowly. People, sometimes they appreciate, sometimes they complain that I try to celebrate Mass a little slower. Just to, to, to never take for granted that privilege of those minutes with the Blessed Sacrament. And it's a healing moment? Being yes. With yes. You felt it yourself? Like Many times, in a spiritual way especially. Just to, that God always wants to renew mm -hmm. His communion with us, especially after like maybe a long week of, of anxiety or decisions that were difficult, or mistakes or regrets. In communion, our, our Lord gives us a, I mean, it's an image for what it's worth it. If heaven is a wedding feast, like Jesus describes heaven as the wedding feast, well then Holy Communion is a kiss. 
And so it's a reconciling, healing kiss of God on someone who doesn't deserve it. And yet our Lord gives it anyway. So it's really beautiful, very healing, very renewing in that relationship, that covenant, almost marital relationship that God wants to have with each one of us. And the last question. Oh, Sorry, Tom. No, you're good. Thank you. There is, um, you know, um, there are a lot of people, you know, they struggle with their thoughts and they want to make it good. And they fall again and fall again. What do you give them as a priest, as an advice, that they don't give up in that no, struggle? Don't give up. Don't give up. God's love is always greater than our faults. No matter how big they are, no matter how many times we keep falling, God's love, and that's, a, that's an act of, of our faith. Lord, I believe that your love is greater than my falls. And so I go back to confession. Yet again, I go back to confession because I believe in it, that your love is greater than my falls. And in time, you live to see, truly, God, you're still holding on to me. Your love has, in fact, been greater than my falls. My falls, I mean, they seem like they had the last word. Oh my gosh, I'm the worst person ever. I just did this terrible thing. That seemed to have the last word. But in fact, that's a memory now of the past. And the last word was God said, but I forgive you. And confession was made available to me. And I live as a, as a child of God. And I love the phrase of God, John Paul II, we are not the sum of our sins and failures. We are the sum of God's love for us. That's the definition of you and of me and of each one of us. So never let sin define you. Not your past sin, not the possibility of your future sin. Never let sin define you or me. But God's love has the last word in who you are and who I am. And at the end, what would you tell people why come to Medjugorje in one time? I think it's a beautiful place for retreat, renewal, a beautiful place to rediscover the beauty of prayer, mm -hmm. of renewal of the Blessed Mother and her closeness. I think there's so much to be gained from taking the time away from the busyness of our daily lives, wherever we're from. And if, it, if God allows it, bring yourself to Medjugorje. But regardless, our, our ladies come into each one. And our Lady wants to be brought more into our homes, into our workplaces, wherever we are, maybe just whatever place you find yourself now, welcome Our Lady into your heart a little more today. And you can give a blessing at the end? Sure. Thank you, Tom. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and all who listen. May the words of our Lord continue to enlighten all of us. And may Our Lady's advice continue to resound in our hearts when she says, do whatever He tells you. Amen. Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank Tom, you, Father. Thank you so much. God bless.